So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined by my colleague Mel Roussel, who's a leadership coach and facilitator. Hi, Mel. Um, Hi. And Mel um, is probably not a well-known thing about Mel, but she was actually the co-founder of Vent. And we met because she came to do came to an event at the event centre I was running in Parnell through a mutual friend of ours, Declan, and we just hit it off. And we've been friends ever since, and we work together with clients as well. So welcome, Mel. Yeah, thanks for having me along. Super yeah. stoked to be here. Absolute pleasure. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. Um, so before we get started, I always ask my guests just to share a professional or personal best so the viewers, listeners can get to know them a little bit better. So what would you say is your professional and personal best in your life so far? Well, let me start with my personal best, and that would have to be my two delightful daughters, uh, Holly and Summer. I think, as most uh, mothers would attend to, there's uh, would attest to, there's nothing really better than having um, wonderful children in your life. So that would definitely have to be my personal best. Yep. And professional best, when you asked me that, oh my goodness, it was so difficult to try and answer. But I think uh, with the coaching that I do, I can have the ability to really change people's lives, change people's mindsets about themselves. And I have seen such significant changes in people's lives as a result of the coaching that I do. And it's so incredibly gratifying to see that. So I would have to say that that's my professional best. Fantastic. Now, you tend to work um, with founders and leaders of private organizations. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yep, yep, yep. So um, so founders, because I, I know what it's like to be a founder. Um, it's tricky. Um, so I can I definitely can help founders and leaders. And everything that I do is all about the human connection. So not really strategic thinking or decision making or analyzing your competitors in the market or anything like that, but all about mastering yourself and optimizing that human connection and creating environments where people can thrive and achieve. That's that's my shtick. Fantastic. And I guess, you know, that that came from your days at Vend, right? So uh, so most people yeah. probably don't know, but you are the co-founder of Vend along with Vaughan. Tell us a little bit about your story um, in terms of starting Vend with Vaughan and where it got to. Just share with us a little bit about the journey. Yeah, well, it was really interesting. Um, my journey with Vend really happens in three acts, if you like. The first yeah. act, the second act and the third act. Um, and the first act started actually on the bedroom floor of my daughter's room when we were living up in Kiri Kiri. And Vaughan said to me, Mel, I've got this idea um, to create this new thing for the, you know, for shops, uh, point of sale, but we need to move back to Auckland. Uh, and we had a bit of a conversation and within 15 minutes, it was decided that we were going to move back to Auckland. By the time we left Summer's room, that was that. Um, we were moving back. And so then uh, we, we relocated back to Auckland and and Vaughan disappeared down into the downstairs bedroom um, for about a year, coding the way. Um, we'd run up the stairs with something to test. You know, Mel, push the button, push the button. And I'd push the button and all of a sudden, you know, a some kind of payment function would come up and we, we, we would be all excited. Um, and then, you know, eventually, uh, as any founder or entrepreneur will know, it's lovely to create something. It feels nice and, you know, is exciting. But then you need to find customers and you need to find investors. And so started the long slog um, of doing that well and truly before we had any office space before we had any other employees or or anything like that. So the very early stage really was about me saying, yep, let's do it. Um, and really allowing Vaughan to bet everything except for the family home uh, oh, because yeah. we had two young children uh, and I wasn't going to put the, our house on the line. But we ate through our savings for a couple of years while, you know, Vaughan was not earning any money, but um, but coding this wonderful thing that would become Vend. Yeah. Um, so I just early, to for a second, Mel, out of interest, did you, the conversation about the house, because that's quite a boundary, isn't it? Like we will do this much, but we won't do that. Did you actually have that sort of conscious conversation about yeah. what those boundaries were? Yep. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and I was happy to support Vaughan in any in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, except I would not uh, put the house on the line. <laughs> that, that for me was the, the absolute no go area. Was that we were not going to do that. Um, so, but in every other respect, that was absolutely yeah. And I think anyone in in a relationship like that will know you know it really takes two people especially when you've got children because you know someone's got to keep the home fires burning while the other person pours himself 100 percent into um into this burgeoning business yep so and then um and then what happened was that we started to grow uh we vendors investment um you know grow and buy investment and so what happens when you have an organization that gets um you know funding is that you tend to grow much quicker than if you're an organization that's bootstrapping or growing organically through profit and so we grew very quickly uh, and we needed a people and culture person and I really didn't want to take on that role at all I had become quite jaded uh, by human resources or even back in the day when it was called personnel um, oh, yeah, I remember yeah, those days. Remember those days? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, we couldn't find anyone. I was like, oh, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, even though I really didn't want to do it. Um, but actually, it was really fun because I could do whatever I wanted to do uh, because I didn't have a traditional manager or, you know, I could just play and have like a little sand pit um, and do what I thought was right. So I really fell back in love with people and culture and was able to make things up and be my quirky self that I am and and I do all of the things that I thought would be good to do, even though they weren't traditionally like best practice or what other people would do. Yeah. Um, and alongside Vaughan, because you know that any – founder of a business like the culture of a business is really a representation of the founder or founders yeah um especially when in those early days when when it's kind of organically growing and then when you get to about 30 or 40 people things tend to break a little bit um because you get the influence of the founder is diluted mm-hmm. and so then you need some systems and some processes in order to keep going the things that you have built organically, um, which tend to be pretty good. Um, although because the culture is representative of the founder, that is all the good bits and also all the bad bits. Yeah. So, so <laughs> the bits of yourself as a founder that you would rather, you know, not think about, well, those bits will come out in your culture as well. So there tends to be like a little bit of fixing up, quite yeah. a little bit of tweaking at about that 30 or 40 um, people mark. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, and, you know, in this stage, Bend was um, growing very quickly, moving very fast. Uh, Lots of people had jobs with many, 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 many hats. Uh, So you would be trying to juggle multiple priorities in any one day or week or month. Um, It's, you know, a typical startup where you just make it all up as you go along. Using... um, trying to get knowledge from as many places as you can but ultimately having to move so quickly that you just need to make very rapid decisions in order to try and stay ahead of the pack Mm -hmm. um and then you know we were growing and growing up until about 250 people um when I left the day-to-day operations and growing overseas as well so you know having to overcome all of those tricky bits um, about opening up overseas offices, trying to keep a culture which was more or less the same but a little bit different. Um, You know, trying to hire people overseas who would be really great culture add to the organisation and all the time with me trying to juggle that and being a wife the main, you know, um, caregiver of the children, yeah. also trying to do Lincoln, you know, parent help at school <laughs> and, and everything else. Yeah. Um, so a very interesting 
dynamic times with a lot of learning. But what was interesting, and I think that's something that um, was, because I can't, for me, it's impossible to tell the Venn story without telling my own personal story. And one of the things that was so interesting in that for me was just such a massive dose of the imposter syndrome, which I know a lot of people resonate with. A lot of people have had that experience. Um, and so in this first act of me at Vend, my Venn story, the imposter syndrome was such, it's like a cloud over that whole time, um, which, you know, was wondering like, well, should I be doing this? Am I the right person to be doing this? Am I just here because I'm sleeping with the boss? You know, would, <laughs> would I get this job if I had applied for the job? Uh, you know, and then trying to juggle these hats. Yep. So many hats at different times of people and culture person, your camp mother, as I was affectionately known. Yep. Um, shareholder, uh, owner of the business, wife, a very, and this is another reason why I think for founders going on that journey, everyone, has, all founders have got multiple, multiple hats to wear. And, and they're learning all reasonably to wear new them. hats, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Vaughan, I mean, so Vaughan came from a programming or, or data background. You ca- you did actually come from a personnel or HR yeah, background. Yeah, 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 so it yeah. It wasn't like you hadn't done this before. No, no, no. But I had come from quite a traditional, I'd been in healthcare, HR and healthcare before okay. coming yeah. into like, you know, startup tech. <laughs> so it's quite different, like, you know, quite different. Um and so in the, I had become quite jaded and had decided to leave HR when I um, got pregnant with my first daughter, first or second, second daughter, I think. And so, because I just had grown not to like it. Um, it had been very adversarial and I used to call myself robo male because I have to go and, you know, do all of these things I didn't really want to do and I had to this persona that I would put on to enable me to do that in that professional sense and and I didn't really enjoy it very much but when I realized at the end that it could be different then I came to just thoroughly enjoy it and I because I actually wrote a book um about my experiences yeah this book here leadership for the fourth age Ta-da. Yeah, great. Um, and and I, I talk about some of the things that I think are important um, that I that I really did at the end, which was all of, I mean, it was all about empathy. Yep. Everything that I did and do is all about empathy and understanding other people and how they tick and what's up for them and how to communicate with them and courage. Because when you're in a fast-moving organization like that, you have to move quickly and you have to do things that scare you, whether that's hiring someone that's smarter than you or making a decision with insufficient information, what you deem as insufficient information, or, uh, you know, going down um, a path that you just don't know where it's going to, you know, you're making bets. You're constantly kind of making bets on things. And being vulnerable. Uh, and I think this was one of the things with, you know, the camp mother hat was that there was a lot of vulnerability in that that I projected um, to being really real, very, very real and authentic, mm-hmm. which then encouraged other people to be real and authentic. And I really think that that's probably the key that created the wonderful, wonderful Vend culture yeah. was that it was very real. It was all about humans. Yeah. not about anything else other than humans and being very curious about your experience and about other people and being consistent with the way that you turn up you know I often joke with my training that it's better to be a consistent asshole than an inconsistent one <laughs> like <laughs> so you'd be true. better to be an asshole every day of the week yeah. rather than just turning up every now and again as a complete a-hole <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's confusing, right? It's having no consistency. That's just, right. That's right. I want to explore a little bit the imposter syndrome. I mean, you you recognize that you had it. How did you overcome that? And did you share okay. that with people as well? And what would because it is something yeah. we all experience, don't we? 
Yes. Okay. Well, let me then wrap up the first act. Yep. Sure. So this was the first act. Yep. Me, Vaughan and I starting the end, growing it and doing, you know, all of those bits and pieces. Yep. Um, act number one. <laughs> so then act number two starts uh, for me in my head uh, during a week off in Cook's Beach and a whole lot of stuff had happened. So Vaughan and I were in the process of separating um, and we're great friends now. Us separating was the best thing um, for the our now it's sort of expanded uh, family. Yep. We were four and now I think we're about eight in the expand, expanded family. Um, so, But nevertheless, at the time, it was a little bit harder um, than now with sort of six years perspective. Yeah. So we were separating. The business had gone, had had to go through a big restructure because sometimes slash often in startups you get your hiring wrong and we hired in front of the curve ahead of the curve and we had to lay a whole lot of people off when the projected numbers didn't hit the forecast so that was going on Um, and because of all of those things that I was talking about empathy and vulnerability and curiosity um uh, robo, I wasn't pos- uh, robo Mel had gone by that stage. So real Mel had to turn up and do that. And that was very difficult. Um, especially when we had recruited people onto this big why, you know, like this big changing the world and the uh, world of um, point of sale. And then, you know, having to turn around and, and let a whole lot of them go was pretty difficult. Yeah. So the marriage was ending the business, which had been going so well, had a massive uh, speed bump. My dad was diagnosed with cancer, uh, and luckily he came through and was fine. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, because Vaughan and I were separating, we just, I'd had decided that I couldn't stay working at Bend because that was Vaughan and Bend were synonymous. So I had to go and do something else. And so I decided to start the business that I'm doing now. Um, which was very scary because Vaughan was the entrepreneurial one. I was always the the very sensible, you know, let's not bet the house, let's let's make to-do lists and let's, you know. And and so uh, for me, that was really, really scary going out on my own, not knowing where I was going to get my next paycheck for and having to go and earn my own crust. Um, And so all of this happened and what happened over about six months or 12 months is that I suddenly got in touch with this resilience and resourcefulness that I never knew I had. Mm. I used to think I was not very resilient. And you know how you do those like um, the personality tests and when you're in people and culture, you do a lot of them mm, yeah. um, by dint of, you know, trialing them out for other people or whatever. And, you know, always go, oh, you know, I can deal with hard things. And I always go, strongly disagree. (laughs) (laughs) And so always there would be this reinforcement of the fact that I wasn't resilient because all of these things just mirrored back to me what I thought about myself. And then through the process of that sort of 12 months of massive, massive growth, I realized, fuck me, excuse me my language Deborah but this was a real you know (laughs) it's important to use that word I am so resilient and I didn't just survive I thrived I absolutely thrived through that time um and I realized that I could do all of this stuff and do it really well uh and not just cope but just you know be amazing at life (laughs) just win at life you know Um, And so it was a real time of finding myself. And then I started um, working for myself. And I remember when I was doing my very first projections for my business, I thought, well, maybe I'll earn like $500 for my first month for my business. I was like, (laughs) maybe I'll earn that. And um, then I realized people started paying me for doing what I do and what I love to do. And then I realized, holy shit. I'm actually good at this. I can actually do this for other people and get the same results. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was interesting as well, because I bet a lot of people recognize this too. When I started out in business, I started doing a lot of things that I thought I should do. Yeah. You know, like I tried to emulate other people. 
And probably for about the first three years, I was trying to emulate other people and doing what I thought was the right thing to do. And then after a period of time, I thought, hang on a minute, actually, people want me for me. So I need to lean into my stuff and what I think and my special way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And so the imposter syndrome got a wake up call. Um, the I realized, and this is one of the biggest realizations in my entire life, that the stories I was telling myself weren't true. Ah. They weren't true at all. Uh, they were just a load of rubbish. And so these days, when I find myself telling myself a story that gets me away from where I want to go, mm -hmm. or that makes me feel bad or diminished, no, well, hang on a minute. How do I know that that story is true? Because I've had a lot of experience stories like that being untrue. Mm -hmm. So the imposter syndrome went because of because I had experienced that it, myself that all of those things that people had been saying all of the time that I thought were lies, they were actually telling the truth. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Um, so I proved to myself that I could do it. And that's how the imposter syndrome went. Fantastic. Mm. That was act two, right? Yeah, so act two, that was the beginning of act two. And act two saw me have very little to do with then. Right. Because I had stepped out of the day-to-day -day operations. I was still the shareholder, so I'd still get the shareholders' reports. But, uh, you know, a lot of the vendors that I knew, you know, a number of them ended up leaving throughout that big restructure. And then more people came on who I didn't know. Yep. So when I went into the office, I wouldn't really know people, which was very strange, really, really odd. Um, and so Act 2 for me was about kind of disconnection. Yep. Like I, I didn't really feel super connected. And it was funny because people would ask me what was going on. And really, I wouldn't have any idea yeah. about what was going on. But it was really gratifying because when I would go back in, I would see all of those things that I set up in the very early days still going. Oh, I was like, wow, this is still here. That's so, so, and obviously a lot of other great stuff um, as well. Yeah. But no, that was really gratifying. So that was act two. We're just not a lot uh, for me there was just not a lot uh, of new, I kind of lost myself in the Vend story. Yep. Vend continued on without me. Um, and I would have to say I'm very grateful for everyone who looked after it um, because they did a wonderful job. Yeah. And then we're into Act 3. Um, and Act 3 is when I get this phone call saying that uh, Vend is going to be acquired by Lightspeed. Yep. And all of a sudden, the Vend story gets reignited in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and a bunch of things happen at about that time. So we have the 10th, Vend's 10th birthday party and a whole bunch of us old vendors get together with the new vendors and celebrate. Um, we have a few parties celebrating the acquisition by Lightspeed. Um, we had Vaughan has his leaving do, which I go along to, and a bit of reminiscing and, and a bit of kind of reclaiming that story. And importantly, reclaiming it for myself, because yeah. it's only now, this is the second time I've told the story. It's only now that I'm really figuring out what the story is. Yep. You know what I mean? <laughs> because it's, <laughs> It, it's kind of come to a natural end, I guess, with the acquisition. So it was very much, I was in there, then it continued on without me, then I was involved again, and then sort of coming full circle and understanding what that, what that meant. And in the meantime, you know, I, I just feel so grateful that in that sort of six years or five years or whatever, when I wasn't in the day-to-day, that I've just built up this amazing practice that I work in every day, doing the same stuff that I was doing there, but with so many different people in so many different industries and making a difference in so many uh, different people's lives. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, it's so, so my story is a bit of a wiggly woggly one. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably quite normal 
yeah. for most founders. It lo- you know, on the outside, it can look quite linear, and yeah. but it, in my experience, it really isn't. <laughs> I'm quite intrigued because obviously you are all about the human connection, and I mean, when a company grows really quickly like that, as you said, it's different to bootstrapping because you really are experiencing huge amounts of growth. How do you make sure that the culture is maintained? How do you make sure you do get the right people on board? What mm. sort of things did you do, especially when you're going into overseas markets? How do you make sure that you've got? Yeah joining who genuinely fit the cultural values and um, yeah. work in addition to the team? Right. Well, there's a couple of things that are super duper important. Number one, of course, is hiring. Yeah. You know, so you need to be very careful if you're hiring and not just hire for culture fit because then you can get a whole lot of people who are all the same, yep. but hiring for culture add and trying to get that diversity but, but people who share those same values as the organization who really dig the things that the organization digs, um, but who don't all look the same. So that's the most important thing is hiring and not being scared to hire people smarter than you. Um, the second thing I would say is onboarding, because especially with an organization like Vend that did things quite differently, people would come into Vend with very different stories or different experiences of how to work in an organization especially as it was growing and we were like maybe 150 people plus so we were kind of larger but we act very different acted very differently to other organizations of a similar size so we had a two a really intensive two-week onboarding process where people would learn about the organization learn about how we did things make friends in the organization learn about the entire ecosystem learn about customers learn about the customer perspective all of this kind of stuff so it was a real um hard and fast introduction to everything to do with vend and so we didn't leave them to get this idea of what it was like to work at vend to osmosis we managed that really really carefully Mm-hmm. And the third thing I would say is leadership um, is so important. So, and that's why I think development in startups is so important because when you have your founding team, um, especially if you are being driven by investment, so you're growing really quickly, it's a bit of a race to try and develop your founding team to the same velocity as the organization is developing. So, for example, Let's say you're, I don't know, chief revenue officer or chief marketing officer or chief product officer or whatever comes on board when you are 30 people, okay? And then you grow to be 250 people in multiple markets and in multiple countries. And this person all of a sudden has a much bigger remit, a much bigger team, having to think much more strategically deal with large uh, multinational partners, you know, the stakes are considerably higher. Yep. And yet this person has grown with you and they might be a really great cultural fit. However, the, there's a real risk that they're not going to be able to grow fast enough to be able to do the job competently when the organization is much bigger. Mm. And so if you bring in someone from the outside then you have all the risks of are they going to be the good culture fit? What other dynamics are they going to bring into the leadership team? Or you've got, can I grow this person so that they can do this role competently, you know, with mentorship, with coaching, with training, with, you know, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And so leadership is so important. You know, that, that saying the fish stinks from the head. Yep. You know, when I go into an organization that's toxic or in some way horribly broken, I always look to the leadership team, the CEO and the board yep. and go, well, what's happening up there? Yep. Um, so that's, yeah, so hiring, onboarding yep. and leadership are the key ones. And then the other one that's also important is how you pay people and reward people because yep. you always follow the money. So if people are doing strange things, Mm-hmm. chances are they're being incentivized for it right and you may not realize that it may be an unintended consequence of your incentives program could you give us an example 
perhaps? Yeah, that? sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So a lot of organisations require teamwork yep. in order to get something done. So then if you are requiring teamwork for people to be able to deliver a great thing to a customer, but then you're incentivizing someone on their individual work, mm-hmm. they will put themselves ahead of the team because that's what you're telling them to do through yeah. your remuneration incentives, right? So on one hand, you're saying it's all about teamwork, but with your money, you're rewarding the individual. Yes. Also, another classic way that you'll see it is that you might reward the sales team for every single um, sign-up that they get, even though that sign-up could be a terrible fit to the product that's going to cause big problems for support. Mm-hmm. And so if you just incentivize sales on on revenue in without any idea of how long that person stays around or their net promoter score or anything like that, then uh, you are potentially causing a problem. Now that makes perfect sense. Excellent. Mm. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your book, Mel. So Leadership in the Fourth Age. What? um... Well, I actually have two books. Okay. Yes. Yes. So this is my first one here, uh, Leadership for the Fourth Age. And the fourth age is the imagination age, where you have to like uh, be very creative, be very imaginative, move super quickly, take risks, work collaboratively in order to get stuff done. Because it's beyond the information age, which is just about your head, and it's into the whole body, the head, the heart, soul, the you know the um, the whole knowledge and wisdom that you get from your body as well. Yeah. And so it's to do, You probably, I don't know if you can see this, but I've got this little Venn diagram on my wall because it talks about leadership for the fourth age being in the middle of three overlapping circles. One is self-mastery. Yeah. So you need to be able to master yourself yep. so that you can do what you want to do for the betterment of your future self. Mm-hmm. The second one is the human connection. So this is all about optimizing those relationships with other people be it one person or a team of people uh, because at the end of the day we're all humans trying to achieve something Mm -hmm. and the third one is the environment or the organizational culture so where how because if you have your self-mastery of yourself and others if you have your human connection but then you are working in an environment that doesn't support those top two that then it's it's a it's not going to be sustainable so those three things are are all really important and then the second books that I've written which are ebooks are all about on-point conversations so digging into communication and how to have a really good quality high stakes conversation because pretty much everything in business boils down to communication yep um, and a lot of people are scared of those high stakes conversations yeah. or they just don't have some of the basic skills that you can acquire to make it so much easier mm. for yourself and the other people. Fantastic. Okay, mm. Paul. Hey, I'm conscious of time. We could talk all day, couldn't we? we, we had some and we have in the past. And we have in the past. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but um, that has been absolutely fantastic. It's been really good to hear your Venn story. I hope you tell it a lot more often. Um, mm-hmm. I think the tips that you've given people are just, uh, yeah, out of this world and, and, and absolutely on point. And so if people do want to have a chat to you, because I know you're very open to helping people and yeah. sharing your founder experiences and things, how would they get hold of you, Mel? Um, they could just go to my website, which is www.melrousel.co.nz. Yep. And there's lots of buttons there that says get in touch with Mel. Um, <laughs> just push the button and yep. you'll email me and more than happy to chat to people. Absolutely. And can they also get the books from that website as yes, well? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Yeah. Yep, yep. Hey, Mel, pleasure as always. Thank you very, very much. Um, yeah. Talk to you again soon. Yes. My pleasure. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks.